Hello and welcome to Nephrology Nursing Perspectives, an official podcast of the American Nephrology Nurses Association. This podcast provides interviews and discussions between members of the American Nephrology Nurses Association and the nephrology community. The podcast focuses on nephrology nurses' issues, health policy, and nephrology nursing as a specialty nursing profession in the areas of conservative management, peritoneal dialysis, hemodialysis, continuous kidney replacement therapies, acute kidney injury, transplantation, industry, and health policy. In this episode, Ms. Lillian Pryor, the 2020-2021 President of the American Nephrology Nurses Association, talks with Mr. Richard Knight about his life with chronic kidney disease, how he was first introduced to chronic kidney disease, and how nursing has impacted his experience. He also gives us some perspectives on how, from his point of view, nursing can make a difference in the CKD world. We are pleased to present Ms. Pryor's interview with Mr. Knight. Welcome, everyone. This is Nephrology Nursing Perspectives podcast, and I am here with an extraordinary, very interesting guest, Mr. Richard Knight. He is the president of the American Association of Kidney Patients. And we are going to have just a little conversation about, first of all, his journey. And then I want to get to know the relationship and how important that nephrology nursing piece fit into that journey. We're just going to go ahead and get started. Welcome, Richard Knight. How are you? Thank you, Lily. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Always enjoy talking with you about patient-related issues and how we relate to nephrology nurses. I think it's a very important role that is often not emphasized enough. Well, thank you. And thank you for sharing some of your time with us today. I'm going to get right into asking you if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about your journey. Okay. I'll shorten it up here. It can be lengthy because it started back in 1996. when I initially could not get life insurance and that concerned me. So I went to my doctor and he did blood work, took urine and told me that the reason for my rejection from the life insurance company was because of protein in my urine. And I said, okay, can you give me a pill or something to fix it? (laughs) Right. Right. And he said, no, it, it doesn't work that way. He said, insurance companies have certain parameters and this is one of them that you exceed their acceptable number for that. But what I like to point out to people is that there was no mention of protein in my urine, as I found out many years later doing my own research. There was no mention that protein in my urine was what I came to find out to be a clear indication of something wrong with your kidneys and possible impending kidney failure. Mm -hmm. That was in 1996. And I stayed with that doctor and someone in his practice, one of the other doctors, he was the lead guy at the time. And I happened to go with one of the other doctors that was closer to where I lived. And she noted that I had high blood pressure Mm -hmm. and proceeded to give me medication for high blood pressure. And in my mind's eye, you know, I felt that half everybody I knew had high blood pressure. So that was not that unusual. From 1996 To the time I went on dialysis in 2004, I continued to take medication for my high blood pressure. The only problem is it didn't work. At the time, I had no concept of what a nephrologist was. Back then, your primary care physician was the gatekeeper, and they would refer you out to specialty accordingly. So in this event, I was never referred. My blood pressure remained high. Mm -hmm. And hence, eight years later, I finally went to a urologist because I had an older brother who had prostate issues. And he suggested, that may be your issue. Why don't you go see a urologist? Which I did. And a urologist indicated to me that my prostate was fine, a little bit enlarging, but fine. But he asked me if I knew or was I aware my kidneys had stopped working or were about at that point. And he advised me, it's like it was yesterday. Mr. Knight, you need to stop what you're doing immediately and go to the emergency room. Wow. So again, not having the knowledge. Mm -hmm. And one of the issues that I found out later on 
was that 32% of the patients that go on dialysis crash there mm -hmm. from the emergency room because the treatment is undiagnosed. It was obviously very upsetting, but when I was in the hospital, I was assigned a nephrologist. The first one, we didn't get along, so <laughs> we just didn't get along. <laughs> you know, I happen to treat doctors <laughs> like anything else. You know, I mean, if we're not a good fit, we're not a good fit. Right. <laughs> but his junior partner came in, and the first thing we talked about was soccer. And I say that because it's important for a healthcare professional to connect with a patient. And he asked me if I understood what was going on. And I said, no, I'm here in the hospital trying to figure out how I can get out. Can you help me? And then he explained the whole situation to me that this isn't something that could be fixed, yeah. that my kidneys were operating at 10 to 15 percent functionality based on my blood work and my urine mm -hmm. and that. I was going to have to go on dialysis wow. and he was very straightforward, very professional. And I appreciated that. Mm -hmm. And so my next thought was, okay, how do I get out of this one? From there, I was assigned a unit and I ended up going to the unit. I dialysized a couple of times in the hospital, but that's very different than being in the dialysis unit. And I was there a little bit over two years. But my education really began when I went into dialysis because I found the whole process to be, in my terms, unacceptable. I'm not a healthcare professional. One of the things I do is, is I teach courses in the management area, strategy, organizational behavior, and things of that nature. All the time that I was on dialysis, I was taking a break from teaching because I was coaching my son's soccer team. And I was the president of a boys and girls club which I continue to do. Mm -hmm. Best advice I got was when I was in the hospital, getting prepped for a catheter to be put into my neck to begin the dialysis process. The orderly or the gentleman that took me downstairs to have this surgery done, he says, bro, I know this is shocking to you. And I can tell that it's like something you're totally unfamiliar with. He said, let me give you some advice that you won't hear from the doctors. <laughs> He said, I've got three siblings all on dialysis. Mm. And he said, it's something that particularly impacts the African-American community. And he said, my sister goes to dialysis and comes out and goes on back to work. Mm -hmm. I have a brother that goes and when he comes out, he can't do anything. And then I have another brother that's on dialysis and he's up and down. Some days he feels good and some days he doesn't feel bad. So what I'm telling you in short is you go into dialysis and see how it impacts you, yeah. regardless of what they tell you, see how it impacts you. And if you're like my sister, you'll be able to continue pretty much doing whatever it is you're doing. If you're like one of my brothers, you won't be, but you won't know that because it affects everybody differently. Mm -hmm. He said, but the important thing is that you have to figure out where you fall there. And no matter what they tell you, it differs from individual to individual. And those were wise words. And that's what I looked out for when I first went to the dialysis session. And back then was during the time of transition for the industry. The large dialysis organizations were buying up all the smaller ones. And I can tell listening to them that they were being given new metrics and they were trying to make numbers. And, you know, that's my game, metrics and numbers and things of that nature. I didn't understand the scientific or healthcare reasons for them. But I could look and say, you'll never meet these numbers mm -hmm. looking at the population that was at the dialysis facility. So my strategy was, how can I get out of this? I mean, I was president of a boys and girls club at the time, and I shared that with some of my members. And one mother said, Richard, you need to get a transplant. I said, OK. She was a nurse, by the way. Mm -hmm. You need to get a transplant and you need to, for people to get tested. She said, I'll get tested and my husband will get tested. I said, tested for what? Uh-huh. He said, test it to see if there's a match. Of course, no concept, no idea about that. But again, you quickly learn, at least I did. And it was very clear to me that the objective of the dialysis facility was not necessarily to get me a transplant. It was to dialysize me. And I want to emphasize for everybody that's listening, that's the business model. So that's not a negative on them. That's how they function. And that's what they do. Unfortunately, many patients expect something else and that doesn't happen. So it was after I came out of dialysis, I got a transplant in October of 2006. So this month is my 15 year anniversary for my transplant. Congratulations. 
So I was in dialysis right under two years, close to two years. Mm -hmm. And it was life-changing experience. The first significant contact I had from having had the transplant was going back and visiting the nurse. <laughs> And I'm embarrassed because I can't recall her name right now, but I do recall this. You will not leave my sessions and you will continue to come to these sessions until you understand the medication you have to take, why you're taking the medication, what your doses is in the medication, and you know it by heart. Yeah. And that was my first major <laughs> exposure <laughs> to. I don't know if she was specifically a nephrology nurse. I would assume that she was because her knowledge base mm -hmm. and understanding and explaining to me what I should do yes. was just insightful. As it talks about my journey, see, it wasn't so much that it was the destination, that it was the process all the way along. I'm still on my journey, quite frankly. Right. And first and foremost, it is important for us to be educated. And yes. that was my first exposure to a real healthcare educator. Thank you so much. Wow, what a journey. And I know you have chronicled everything <laughs> that has happened on those journeys. I know up and down. But two things just came out, actually more than two things, quite a few things. The first thing I think that kind of resonated with me was you mentioned not kind of jiving so much with your nephrologist, the first nephrologist, but the junior partner that came in, you connected with because you talked about, let me get to know who you are as a person. And so right. I guess that phrase, I don't know if it was Maya Angelou or not, but people don't care what you know until they know how much you care or that you care. That's right. And so from a nursing perspective, I know that that's one of the qualities that we have. And we're going to get to that in a second. And then second, I just want to bring about the lack of knowledge or even the lack of awareness that you had that so many other people have about any connection to chronic kidney disease, to anything else, to diabetes or hypertension. And the fact that it took eight years, it was eight years that you even knew that you had hypertension that connection to chronic kidney disease and your kidneys being affected by that still wasn't. It was never clear to me. Yeah, right. And, and I didn't connect the dots. Yeah. And when but, he told me your kidneys are gone and we talked about the reason for it, well, your high blood pressure, wow. you know, diabetes, high blood pressure, number one and two mm -hmm. in terms of mm -hmm. the cause for people losing their kidneys. Wow. And I said to myself, uh-huh. And the thing that I want people to be aware of is that they call it the silent killer for a reason yeah. because it's not like you feel any pain. You do feel a little lightheaded when you have high blood pressure. And some people go through the process of swelling and all of that. I think one time I swelled and the doctor gave me water pills and that went away and I just continued to function. Okay. And I did have some issues towards the end in terms of the muscles in my stomach churning. Mm -hmm. which was my body trying to reject those toxins that were inside of me, but they weren't going anywhere. Right. right. And not being able to pass water. Mm -hmm. You know, when you go to a football game and you have the long lines and you wait to go to the bathroom, mm -hmm. well, everybody would go to the bathroom. And this happened for three or four years. And if you think of somebody with a water gun, they would have one of those big Uzis. And I had a little squirt gun. <laughs> and I'd say, I don't know why these people are taking so long. Like, what is wrong with them? And I would just go up there, squirt, squirt, I'm done. <laughs> and again, later, being educated, knowing that when you're on dialysis or your kidneys go bad, you stop passing water, you stop, great. which is, great. you know, one of the main problems. Yes. So yes. in retrospect, as I look back at my experience, that's why I do what I do now. That's why I'm here talking with you, because I want to share this information to as many folks as possible. Thank you. And I think you're teaching us a lesson, even as nurses, to ask those questions, because sometimes we don't ask those questions. Mm -hmm. And so just the awareness from your point of view, these are the questions that we need to ask as well that would prompt that conversation that we can kind of get that increased awareness and kind of help connect the dots. I mean, I know, yeah, the Internet is great and we go online and we look up a few things, but that's not how it should be we should kind of be on the forefront of this and be able to talk with people where they are 
in their community, in their environment, and ask the right questions, especially about this. Absolutely. All right, we're going to move on, although I could talk to you for hours and hours. I'm going to try to bring this back to nursing. And another thing you mentioned, you were in the hospital, but it was different kind of than being in the unit. And so now tell me, let's go a little bit now about being in the dialysis facility and just your experience with the nurses there compared maybe with the docs. The person that was in charge of the facility was a nurse. And she also had, because those facilities, you know, when they're running three shifts from 6.30 in the morning to 4 or 5 at night. So her backup was also a nurse and two very knowledgeable people. But again, when you go into dialysis, you don't know all of that. You have these texts that are sticking you and taking you through the process. And you quickly learn the pecking order, as I did. And I'll never forget that one day I was, you know, something's not right. And I don't know what it is. And the text said, well, you know, your flow and everything is okay. This is okay. So sometimes new patients don't really understand. I said, you know, that'd be okay. But I don't accept that. Quite frankly, I don't think that you know the answer. (laughs) I said nothing personal, but this is my life we're dealing with. Exactly. And I said, in my world, If there's a problem, you make an assessment. And then based on your analysis, you get a recommendation. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget the nurse walked by and said, he needs a fistula grant. And I said, what's that? You go to the doctor. They're going to check your fistula. They're going to see if the veins are open and the blood is flowing through everything properly. Mm -hmm. And based on that, I said, that's what I'm talking about. I don't know its name, but I know it's got to exist. Yes. And I went to the doctor and found out that some of my veins had closed up. And yeah. although everything was flowing properly, it wasn't flowing to the right place. Right. So, you know, again, I mean, just a nurse making a very quick assessment. On another occasion, my first day, when you infiltrate, you miss the vein. Yes. They missed the vein and they had to take me out because my arm swelled. About a week later, one of the techs put the needle in and I said, you need to take the needle out. Right. She said, why? I said, because you missed the vein. She says, no, I don't see anything. I said, take the needle out. All of a sudden, my arm ballooned. And again, the nurse came over and said, you have to listen to the patient. He was telling you something was wrong. Yes. So his session's over for today. Mr. Knight, we're going to tape you up and we have to wait, you know, for this to go down and come back during your next session. But please try to be as lenient as possible as you can on the fluids that you drink, because we've not been able to achieve. I said, I know I didn't make my dry weight for the day. And, but again, understanding that the texts were very good, Mm -hmm. but they had their limitations. And I would have the conversations with the nurses about, well, I don't want them to take as much fluid off of me as they do Mm -hmm. because I feel bad. And she said, we're not talking most patients. We're talking me, specifically me. I don't leave here and go home and go to sleep. Mm-hmm. I leave here and go to the soccer field right. or I was on the board of Chambers at the time. I was on the board of my son's school. I said, or I leave here and go to a meeting. So I need to be able to function as I normally do. And when they take too much fluid, which is when I learned, I didn't know the technical term for it, but I learned about fluid management. Mm-hmm. And I'd be surprised at the number of people who used to call me from throughout the country as I got involved with AAKP. You know, my cousin is on dialysis and they're in intense pain. After every session, and you seem to function. I say, tell them to watch the amount of fluid that they're taking from them. They got this little calculator, and they'll calculate how much fluid they're going to take. In most cases, that's too much. Mm -hmm. Too much for them to function. Mm -hmm. You have to learn these things. And the other, how can I say it? Thing that I'm not excited about, as when I was at the dialysis facility, and they were doing all of this absorbing of smaller facilities, They were also laying off nurses. They were changing the composition of the workforce. More technicians, Mm -hmm. less nurses, Mm -hmm. which I always say to the nurses of the world, we must resist (laughs) because it's very subtle, but the metrics don't get any better. As a matter of fact, they get worse. That's for you and the fellow (laughs) nurses to be aware of as you pursue advocacy on your own behalf. Because nurses, dietitians, social workers, which were areas that they cut. Yeah. See, that's my business hat. 
but I related the business to how patients' quality of life was impacted by those cuts. They would just not hire more dietitians. They would spread them out among the units. So they couldn't do as much as they could do before. Same thing with social work, because it helped you negotiate the system mm -hmm. because it's a very complicated system. Getting you know the forms properly filled out for Medicare mm -hmm. versus your mm -hmm. individual coverage if you have it. And of course, with the nurses being able to give you the insights that you need to really take care of any serious issues. The doc will come around, look at the clipboard. Be nice, be nice now. <laughs> <laughs> look at the clipboard, say, is everything okay? How do you feel? The real value for my nephrologist, and by the way, I have that same nephrologist since 2004, was going to visit him after I had my transplant. Okay. But when I was on dialysis, because I was low maintenance, but he did tell me, like my transplant surgeon told me, I was very healthy. I just did not have a kidney and I needed to get a transplant. Yeah. But there was no discussion about strategy, how to go about doing that. And I did my own research and found out that Hopkins, for example, had a lower success rate, but that's because they did much more riskier cases. Washington Hospital Center had a very, very high success rate, but they were very selective in the patients that they took. Okay. So two extremes. So low success rate wasn't necessarily bad. And the high success rate didn't make them that much better than Hopkins. It just meant that they were more selective in the patients that they took. That they chose. So the probability uh -huh. of it being successful was much and, and fortunately, like the doctor said, I was very healthy. Mm -hmm. So I was able to make the cut. I had no comorbidities. I only had high blood pressure. I was not diabetic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was not too obese. By normal standards, I was not too obese. Okay. And I was a good candidate. And although I didn't know it at the time, based on information I was aware of, I wanted to get a kidney from a living donor as opposed to a deceased donor, simply because they told me that those kidneys lasted longer. So we are in right now, I would say probably the most attention maybe that chronic kidney disease has had in a long time. And when we look at the focus that's being put on, I'm going to start saying kidney health as opposed to kidney disease. Where do you see nurses fitting into that? Now, I know we advocate and we have some part of advocacy, but what would be, from your perspective, the best way that we can advocate for this? And we're talking about an increase in home as an option. And a little bit, we're talking about trying to. What do we do to delay that progression, like you mentioned, to end-stage kidney disease? How do you see nurses? And can you give us some pointers just from your experience? Because I know you advocate a lot. <laughs> That's what AAKP does for the patients. But just help us, help us to understand how we can help you better. Of course, I have a strategy that I would propose to the nurses, particularly the nephrology nurses. I think one of the big challenges is for us to go further upstream early identification of the disease. The primary care physicians are overwhelmed. Yes, It's a very difficult disease to manage. It's capacity, that's no knock on them, but they simply don't have the training and the capacity to manage these CKD patients. As the system is now, where they're making referrals of a CKD patient to a nephrologist at CKD4, I'm just gonna say is one of the, I don't wanna use the term dumb, but one of the most ill-advised Mm. approaches. Mm -hmm. Because at that point, you're so far down the stream. So when well, my recommendation would be, they've got all these different models that they're developing yes. due to the executive order by former President Trump. As the nephrology organizations, practices look at implementing those, I would suggest that they make an effort to get more involved with primary care physicians organizations, and this is a change, but it can happen and it makes sense for everybody. Mm -hmm. It makes sense for them to get further involved upstream. And in order to do that, they need to engage the nurses to do that which needs to be done uh -huh. mm -hmm. to advise and direct and help manage this large group of patients mm -hmm. that would be in the pipeline if they got them at CKD two or three. The primary care physicians can't do it. It's going to be a cost saver. It would help prolong or stave off the progression of the disease. 
it would be the ability to educate the patients mm -hmm. so that they would know more about their options. You know, at AAKP, we have a mantra, early detection, educate the patient, slow the progression, consider if you have to a preemptive transplant. And if you have to go on dialysis, go there with an exit plan. Because when you're in dialysis, you simply don't get the most education mm -hmm. with respect to transplantation. So I think the role for nurses can be expansive. The reality is we have a shortage of nephrologists. Right. And these numbers are not going to decrease. Yes. So in my opinion, it looks like there's an opportunity to increase the pipeline because I got another plan for that to get out to these nursing schools and get more focus on becoming a nephrology nurse because most of the nephrology nurses that I know come to being a nephrology nurse in a circuitous manner. <laughs> it seems like you don't go to school to be a nephrology nurse. You kind of either through an intern or you kind of get thrown into that role. Mm. And I think that it's a career opportunity that would be available for many nurses if they knew about it beforehand. You know what? I have to agree. I would say I've talked to quite a few and a large amount of us kind of trip into <laughs> nephrology nursing. Mm -hmm. And But there's the other side too, right? We say either you love it or you hate it. And a large portion of us really, really love it and would do absolutely, like myself included, would do absolutely nothing else. I certainly agree that we have to start thinking about preventative as opposed to primary care, as opposed to tertiary care. That's so right. we want to get ahead of this and get in front of this. But there is a nursing shortage as well. And so to your point, we have to start getting into the grammar schools and into the high schools to kind of encourage this wonderful profession. Absolutely. I, I totally agree. I totally agree with that. And thank you for just kind of your take on how nursing needs to kind of get more involved, particularly our nephrology nursing. The American Nephrology Nurses Association has been around for 50 years. And so there's nothing more, I think, exciting or nothing more, what's the word? I, I can't remember the phrase, but it's something like as an idea whose yeah. time has come. It's an idea whose time has come. <laughs> And the other thing to keep in mind, see, there's a model, what we call a business model, that pretty much is dominated mm -hmm. or promoted by the large dialysis organizations. And again, as I tell people, that's not making anyone out to be evil. That's just their business model. Well, there are other models that are becoming more prevalent. Mm -hmm. You have your Somatis, you have your CVS kidney care mm -hmm. that looks at well, let's see if we can advise these patients and help take care of some things on a preventative basis. And if that's me, I'm going to these large payers and selling them my services about prevention. Yeah. Because it'll resonate with the large insurance companies that pay the bills for dialysis. Right. And you can run the numbers. If you can stop a patient from going on dialysis for five years, that's five times, say, $80,000. That's $400,000. If you multiply that by 100 patients, that's a lot of money. It can be yes. done. They talk about the additional cost of patients for diversity and all that. And I say, I don't accept that. Just like I don't accept the additional cost of this. It's a savings. And even they may not recognize the savings, but it's still a savings. And if you do the statistics, you try to pilot program over a five-year period of time, you probably see the savings jump off the chart. Exactly. The fact that the population is, although it's getting younger, you still have people who are older on dialysis. So if they're on the Medicare and they've got one of these programs, Medicare Advantage or something of that nature, you just include them in. Now, it's very interesting because I happen to have Medicare Advantage. And I happen to have the nurse and the social workers come out and talk with me. It's not an ego trip or anything, but I generally know more about the situation or the disease than what they do. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not every patient, but many patients who are, you know, I talked to a young lady who was CKD3. Mm -hmm. And she said her doctor told her not to worry about that. Right. And I said, well, I'm not going to tell you to worry about it. What I'm going to do is tell you that you should check on it. Because if you're 67 and you're CKD3, and that's where you've been. That's one thing. But if you were CKD2 last year and you're CKD3 this year, then you should worry about it. Right. 
those are subtle things or not so subtle things that, like you said, though, like you alluded to, primary care doesn't necessarily have the bandwidth to address that. And so our nurse practitioners can come in. If you want to do something new, you got to do something you've never done. So we got to start thinking about this differently. That's right. And you propose and you've talked about quite a few different routes we can kind of take. I want to just encourage our nurses to just be more involved like you have. And we, I think, know kind of what to do. There's nothing new under the sun. And so we've heard this so many times, but we've 4 million strong in nephrology nursing just with A&A, we have 8,000 plus nurses wow. that are just part of our membership. Now we know there are so many more out there that are mm-hmm. not part of A&A, but imagine banding together with nurses. It's not just kidney disease, right? It's heart disease and it's, it's across blood. the board. And again, that's where nurses come in because, you know, hey, you're a nurse, you know, you take the courses. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know about all these different things. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's diabetes, there's heart issues, there's liver issues. I mean, there's so many different things that can have an impact on the disease, whether it be somebody not eating properly, eating the wrong things. And I mean, just a whole host of things, not taking care of themselves. I see so many people as they begin to age, I say, listen, man, you don't have to become a super workout guru, but kind of get up and go out for a walk. I like to go out and not wear a mask. And I said, oh, I don't pay the attention to what they tell you on TV because they politicize this virus. Mm. But for example, I'm sure that your organization does. I know we do. We provide a number of webinars with factual information Mm -hmm. so that patients can understand what's going on. I want to get back to the point of the nurses being a more integral part of the new models that are more preventative Yes, and take care of the patients. And with more home dialysis taking place, you know, there's telehealth sessions, just being able to pick up the phone and call and talk with someone, see how they're doing, particularly if it's home dialysis and they have one of the machines that have all of the connections to it. You know, Mm -hmm. I have a sleep apnea machine and when my guy calls me, you know, he's looking at my dashboard. I had to download it. So I had to have as much information as him, which is very useful. But again, that's what technology can do. And nurses can get to the point where they can advise the patients as well as the docs. And the fact of the matter is there's not enough docs to go around. Yes. Not enough nurses to go around. But working together, I think you could play a much more effective role. Even going up and advocating the CMS to change and accept some of these new models that go upstream. Mm-hmm. further and do the preventative piece, which is much less expensive than having to deal with patients when they go on dialysis. I wouldn't wish dialysis on anyone. Yes. All right. Well, we are coming to the end of our time here. And like I said before, I could just talk with you for hours and hours, but I just want to take the time to say thank you so much for agreeing to spend a little time with me talking and just getting new perspectives, right? Yeah. In, in your perspective and just giving the nephrology nurses some food for thought. Thank and I want to make one last pitch here. I yeah. want the nephrology nurses, I want that leadership to get together and come up with a plan. Patients will certainly work with you to approach some of these colleges. I'm just going to say it. Absolutely. You should be approaching each HBCUs. Yes. And talking with them and exposing them to the opportunities that are available to them in the nephrology nursing as a career path. Absolutely. Now, it's not going to be for everyone, but I think that you would do yourself a great service. I know I work at Bowie. They have a nursing department, and that is something that they're not familiar with over there. I just think that is something that should be done. And we'll do a proposal to some of these companies to underwrite that. Mm -hmm. I love it. Well, on that note, we are going to end this episode of Nephrology Nursing Perspectives. And I have been speaking with Mr. Richard Knight from AAKP. Thank you all for listening. And we'll talk again or we'll listen again real soon. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Nephrology Nursing Perspectives is owned and produced by the American Nephrology Nurses Association. All rights reserved. No portion of this podcast may be used without written permission. 
Mr. Richard Knight is a healthcare professional and a former patient who received hemodialysis and received a kidney transplant approximately 15 years ago. Mr. Knight is president of the American Association of Kidney Patients, the oldest and largest independent kidney patient organization in the United States. He is a former member of the NIDDK Advisory Council and serves as the co-chair of the Stakeholder Engagement Subgroup for NIDDK's Strategic Plan. He is also a member of the Scientific Registry for Transplant Recipients Review Committee and co-chair of the SRTR's Patient and Family Advisory Subcommittee. Mr. Knight has a background in public policy and congressional operations based on his professional experience on Capitol Hill, where he served in various roles, including communications, policy, and legislative director, and his advocacy work as a kidney transplant patient. While working in the U.S. House of Representatives, Mr. Knight served as a liaison to the Congressional Black Caucus for his member of Congress. He was involved in work with the House Energy and Commerce and Small Business Committees. Mr. Knight's knowledge of executive branch agency budget and procurement policies is based on direct experience as a federal government contractor and a 10-year co-chair of the Baltimore-Washington Corridor Chamber of Commerce Annual Regional Government Procurement Fair. Mr. Knight is a business strategist providing patient engagement consulting for healthcare organizations and businesses developing tools designed to leverage patient input and preferences in their care plans and quality measures. As a small business owner, he is heavily involved in business and education issues through multiple networks in the Washington, D.C. region. He serves as a lecturer in Bowie State University's College of Business, is a founding member of Bowie State University's College of Business Advisory Council, and currently serves on the College of Business Strategic Planning and Fundraising Committees. Ms. Lillian Pryor is Senior Manager for Medical Education for CVS Kidney Care. A member of the American Nephrology Nurses Association since 1990, Ms. Pryor has served in roles that include President-Elect, ANNA Director, ANNA Awards and Scholarships Committee Chairperson, ANNA representative to the Kidney Health Initiative Patient Preference Task Force, and an author and peer reviewer for the Nephrology Nursing Journal. Ms. Pryor served as the 2020-2021 President of the American Nephrology Nurses Association. In addition, she is an active member of ANNA's Dogwood Chapter in Georgia and has served the chapter as both its President and Health Policy Representative. For archived episodes of this and all ANNA podcasts, and to learn more about the American Nephrology Nurses Association, visit ANNANurse.org. You can subscribe to Nephrology Nursing Perspectives, NNJ Extra, and ANNA's 50th Anniversary Podcast Series on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, our hosting site Spreaker, and everywhere podcasts are found.